Exploring the great outdoors is one of my favorite ways to spend my free time, and while out in nature, I especially enjoy coming across different species of wildlife. If I would have to pick one group of animals as my favorite to find, then snakes would be at the top of my list. While most people tend to avoid these legless reptiles, I on the other hand go out of my way to try and find them. Over the past few years, I've managed to come across a couple dozen different species of snakes and probably hundreds of individuals. So for those of you who might be interested, I wanted to share some strategies I use to try and find snakes. Before you even think about heading outside to try and find some snakes, I think it's important to first learn at least some of the different species that live in your area. To emphasize this importance, I will compare the amount of snakes in states that I've lived in. Growing up in Massachusetts, it was only possible for me to find a total of 15 different species of snakes. Now 14 of these species are native to the state, but one, the Brahmini blind snake, is an introduced species that has only been discovered in some nurseries around the city of Boston. Only two of the native species, the eastern garter snake and the northern water snake, can be found across the entire state. In the state of Georgia, there are 46 different species of snakes that are native. 13 of Massachusetts' 15 snakes also occur in Georgia, but that means that there are 33 other snakes native to Georgia that do not occur in the Bay State. There are several reasons that we'll discuss in a bit as to why places like Georgia in the U.S. have so many more snakes than other states, but this is one of the reasons why it is important to know what snakes live in your area, and even more importantly, how to identify them. For example, many New Englanders are convinced that water moccasins, aka cottonmouths, are found in their freshwater wetlands. But in actuality, the Great Dismal Swamp in southeastern Virginia serves as the northern limit for all the cottonmouth species. So what are some resources you can use to learn about the snakes in your area? I recommend, since we live in the digital age, that if you Google snakes that live in your state, there should be a link to at least one website that lists all the state's snakes and some tips you can learn to identify them. Also, if you happen to find a snake or take a picture of one, then you can use apps on your phone such as Google Lens that can ID subjects in an image. But what happens when you're outside and you can't get internet access or maybe you're someone who is a little more traditionalist? The answer to all the above that I recommend is either borrowing or purchasing a good old fashioned field guide, one that has pictures and descriptions of the snakes that are found in your area. Peterson Field Guides are some of the best for snakes, but your state may also offer their own field guides as well. Here is a field guide that includes all of Georgia snakes, and one for all of Massachusetts snakes that I use. I find the size differences between these field guides to be amusing, by the way. Once you've obtained some knowledge of all the snakes that live in your area, it's time for you to do some more research. Okay, so now you know what snakes live near you, but where exactly do you go to see them? Well, that can vary. From a species level or a subspecies level, different snakes have different geographical ranges where they occur, and range maps, which can be found in most field guides, perfectly illustrate this. Here is one from the charismatic water moccasin I mentioned earlier. Now these maps can be very broad, but there are also range maps for a species within a specific state. Here is one for cottonmouths in Georgia. When looking at range maps, you may notice, as I mentioned earlier, that some snakes can be found across an entire state, and others may be in only specific areas. For example, here is a range map for garter snakes, and here is a range map for eastern hognose snakes, both for the state of Massachusetts. To understand the differences between these two species, we have to look at the habitats these snakes occupy. Garter snakes are what we refer to as 
habitat generalists, meaning that they live in a variety of different habitats. Garters can live in upland rocky habitats, around a variety of different freshwater habitats, fields and grasslands, flower beds and gardens around people's homes, and under trash, surrounding railroad tracks in cities. Eastern hognose snakes in Massachusetts, on the other hand, are habitat specialists, meaning that they live in a specific type of habitat. Specifically, these snakes love to live in areas with well-drained, loose, sandy soils. The most common of these habitat types are pine barren forests, which are dominated by pitch pine and scrub oak, tend to be open areas lacking a midstory, and are dependent on fire for regeneration. Because pine barren forests are not found across the entire state of Massachusetts, hognose snakes here have a more limited distribution than a garter snake who lives not only in the same types of habitats as hognose snakes, but in pretty much any other type of habitat you can think of in the state. But searching in the right habitat alone doesn't guarantee that you will always find a snake. Seasonal variability greatly influences the activity level of snakes, so it's important to know when is the best time to try and find snakes. Let's start by disproving the silly word cold-blooded we use to describe snakes. Snakes are not cold-blooded, they are ectothermic. An ectotherm's body temperature is correlated to the temperature of the surrounding environment. If it is 50 degrees in a snake's environment, then the snake's body temperature is going to be around 50 degrees. However, if a snake is basking on a rock or chilling on a road, which are both absorbing more heat from the sun and therefore are much warmer than the rest of the surrounding environment, then the snake's body temperature will be closer to that of the rock or the road, which can both be well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, temperatures that could well kill a human. This is why temperature and climate are the greatest factors that influence the biodiversity of snakes. To emphasize this even more, let's go back for a minute to talking about the species differences between Massachusetts and Georgia. Massachusetts is in the northeastern corner of the U.S. and experiences an average daily high of 32 degrees Fahrenheit during the winter months. From January to early March, any day where temperatures climb above 40 degrees are considered mild. Georgia is in the southeast of the U.S., where from May to November it gets above 80 degrees almost every day and the humidity is higher than almost anywhere else in the country. While I can imagine it must get somewhat cold up in the southern Appalachian region of the northern part of the state, the winters in Georgia are still very mild. In the coastal plain region of the state, the daily high was always between 50 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit when I lived there. The coldest day I ever experienced in South Georgia was a daily high of 38 degrees, while the coldest daily high I ever experienced in Massachusetts was more than 40 degrees colder. Also, it never snows in most of Georgia, where the average snowfall in Massachusetts is 4 feet during the winter. During early May of 2022, I spent some time in Massachusetts, and the warmest it got during my visit was only 57 degrees Fahrenheit. When I left, it was raining and just 50 degrees, but when I arrived in South Georgia just a few hours later that same day, it was sunny and 90 degrees. So more mild winters in longer periods of warm weather is the reason why there are more snake species in Georgia than in Massachusetts. Some snakes just can't survive in places that routinely experience tons of snow and below freezing temperatures for a substantial amount of time. For example, if you take a dusky pygmy rattlesnake that lives in South Georgia and move it up to Massachusetts, it will not be able to survive the much colder New England winters. So the 14 native snakes to Massachusetts must either be extremely cold tolerant or have to go deep enough underground to escape the freeze line to survive the winter months. But in both Massachusetts and Georgia, the winter months are one of the most challenging times of the year to find snakes, because in both places, it's just too darn cold for most snakes to be regularly active who live there. 
But because snakes are ectothermic, the intense heat of the summer months is another challenging time to find snakes because it is too hot for them to be moving around regularly. So knowing the time of year that snakes in your area are active and not active is very important because you could be in the right habitat, but if you're out in the month of May, you might have a better chance of seeing a snake in the same spot than say in January and July. The time of year also influences the time of day that snakes are most active. In the case of some species like the eastern hognose, they may be strictly diurnal, so it always becomes more difficult to see one the later it gets during the day, regardless of the time of year. However, the best time to see an eastern hognose is either between May and June, during the first breeding season and when gravid females are laying eggs, and during September and October, which is when the second breeding season occurs and when neonates from those eggs laid in the late spring hatch and search for overwintering sites. Typically, the spring and fall are the best time of the year to see snakes during the day because the spring is when many emerge from brumation and the fall is when they are moving back to their overwintering sites. But the best time to see snakes at night is generally during the summer months because temperatures are similar to those of the daily highs of the spring and fall and more heat is also retained on the roads. The time of year can also influence the habitats that snakes occupy. For example, eastern indigo snakes in Georgia usually overwinter in gopher tortoise burrows during the winter months and can be observed basking around the entrance of the burrows during the day. These ideal burrows occur in the xeric sandhills associated with the imperiled longleaf pine forest ecosystems. However, the sandhills become too hot for the indigo during the spring and summer months, so during this time, they move to the cooler riparian habitats surrounding wetlands. This is why understanding a snake species' life history can be very beneficial to helping you find one in the wild. Now that you know what snakes live in your area, what habitats they live in, and the best time of year to see them, how do you go about finding them? Well, there are a few methods that you can use to search for snakes. Road cruising is a great method for finding snakes, especially in the southern U.S. This is simply defined as driving around while looking for snakes who may be crossing roads. This can be the most efficient way to find snakes because you're able to cover more area in less time. While visiting the Everglades for a few days, I road cruised almost 200 miles looking for snakes. And in one night in Georgia, I found 10 snakes in 250 miles of road cruising. During the spring and fall, road cruising is best conducted during the day because that's when snakes will be most active and road cruising at night should be done only when temperatures are above 70 degrees Fahrenheit. In some places, the best time of night to road cruise is one hour before and after sunset, but in other places, the best time can be after midnight. The biggest drawback to road cruising is that it can get very expensive from money spent on gas and the wear and tear on your vehicle. You're also at greater risk of running over snakes, other herps, and wildlife accidentally. Not to mention it produces more emissions, which is bad for the environment. But if driving around and looking for snakes isn't for you, there are other methods that also work for finding snakes. Flipping artificial and natural cover in most places can be the best way to find snakes. This is because many snakes like to hide under things like rocks and logs for shelter. So flipping those natural cover objects is a great way to find snakes. However, snakes also love to hide under litter. Things like piles of wood, tin, couches, doors, Rubbermaid lids, mattresses, seats from cars, and tarps are all excellent places to find snakes under. In my experience, I have flipped black racers, milk snakes, garter snakes, ring-necked snakes, eastern hognose snakes, and an eastern coach whip, all under human litter. If you have open space on your property that is on the edge of some woods, lay down some boards or tin 
and you may be able to find some snakes. One important reminder is to always return any cover object back to the spot that you found it. Flipping cover objects disturbs the microhabitats of not just snakes, but other wildlife as well. So leaving an object turned over can be incredibly detrimental. A good alternative to both road cruising and flipping is just walking around some habitat and trying to find snakes out and about. This can be just walking around the edge of your house or doing transects in wooded or open areas covering as much ground as possible. Walking on foot means that you can access some microhabitats that just might not be possible to reach while driving a car and you can get up close with some really cool snakes in a more natural setting. But regardless of how and when you look for snakes, there are always important reminders you should always consider when out in the field. When out searching for snakes, I think it is always important to consider how your presence can influence the behavior of these animals and how our actions can impact populations. While we are enjoying our encounters with snakes, they on the other hand are most likely incredibly stressed because they think that something is trying to eat them. What we might view as being aggressive is a snake that is doing everything it can to defend itself even if that means if it's trying to bite you. So here are some ideas that I feel can lead to more positive and ethical snake encounters. These ideas are not trying to deter you from looking for snakes, but instead are trying to bring some awareness that can be beneficial to the snakes you find. 1. Try and limit how much time you spend with a snake. This can always be challenging, especially if you come across a snake you have either never seen before or haven't seen in a while. I feel that time spent interacting with a snake should be correlated to how you're interacting with it. If you're photographing the snake from a distance and it isn't reacting to your presence, then the time you spend with that snake isn't as significant. However, if you alter a snake's movement or handle the snake, then you should be focused on trying to grab as much footage as you need as quickly as possible and then just let the snake go on its way. I remember stumbling upon an eastern diamondback rattlesnake in the sand hills of Florida, which was the first time I'd ever encountered one recreationally. I was focused on grabbing as many photos and videos as I could, but the snake was also rattling non-stop, so it was clearly stressed by my presence. So as tempting as it was to spend as much time with this snake, I let it be once I finished capturing the footage I needed just several minutes after first finding it. Two. Try to limit any disturbances to the habitats you visit. This can be simply always placing cover objects back that you flipped where you found them, or just moving slowly through fragile landscapes such as upland rocky habitats that have a loose substrate. This could also be limiting how often you visit sites, especially those where you are constantly altering microhabitats that snakes may be occupying. Three. Be discreet about sharing location information. I personally feel that when sharing your snake finds with others, even on social media, it is very important to be discreet about how much information you share. There are people who illegally collect and kill snakes, so sharing online exactly where you found them can be very detrimental in some cases. Also, some images themselves can also reveal locations, so being aware of that is important as well. It is always great to find snakes with groups of people, but in some cases, it may be beneficial to limit how many you take to specific locations. The reason being is that it increases the probabilities of all the negatives that I just listed above. It is also a good segue into my final point. 4. In some cases, you should minimize how much time you interact with certain snakes or don't even go searching for them at all. These are usually species who face intense protections at the state or even federal level, whose populations have declined precipitously because of human interactions. If you do happen to come across any of these species, it is very important to be as ethical as possible when interacting with them, and being as discreet as possible if you decide to share your experiences outside of submitting your observations to state databases.
I hope that this video was informative and insightful regarding trying to find snakes in the wild. Despite the fears these animals generate in our society, it is always important to remember that snakes are just animals trying to eke out an existence in a challenging world. While it may be difficult to convince most of the general public that the fear of snakes is an irrational one, especially here in the US, being able to change some perspectives that result in more respect or even admiration towards snakes is something I always try to strive for. With all that said, I hope that this video inspires you to try and find snakes in the wild, which may lead to the opportunity to interact with them as ethically as possible. Thank you so much for checking out this video. Consider liking and subscribing to my channel for more snake-related content, and I wish you the best of luck in your snake adventures.